Right, stay with me. Please don't unsubscribe. Today we've got a Commodore, a 1970s Commodore pet no less. The first one we've had in, so this is going to be an interesting repair job. This is quite an early version of the Commodore PET, 2001. You can tell by the tiny chiclet keyboard, the 69 keys, the tiny little keys, allow for a dataset to be fitted into the case as well. This dataset is known as the Piano Deck, as you can tell, the keys look like piano keys. Although the keys on this are really small, it is surprisingly usable. As you can see, the size of the keys is about a fingertip, so it's actually not too bad. I do want to point out this is the oldest machine we've had on the channel so far, with development starting in 1976. These early pets have a smaller monitor than the later models. It has a blue border and a white phosphor. Later this became a black border and a green phosphor. So let's open it up and see what we're faced with. Unfortunately there are lots of gaps around the case of a pet where the edge connectors are and so on. So this thing in storage has become extremely dirty. These capacitors are totally caked in crusty stuff. The entire board is grimy and there's even gravel inside the case. I found rat droppings, lots of dead spiders. Although I'm not being asked to restore this machine, I just need to get it working. I am going to put some effort in to clean it up as best as I can. Somewhere underneath all of this is a 6502 processor and a bunch of ROM chips as you can see here. This particular PCB revision is a 320132, which means it has 6540 ROM chips um, combined with 2114 RAM chips. And I'm about to find out that these ROM chips tend to die. Another restoration job that I'm not equipped to do would be to restore this transformer. So, before we start trying to figure out why it's not working, I'm going to take the PCB out, which means disconnecting all of these connectors. There's the tape deck, we also have the power connector, the keyboard connector and the video connector. We'll look closely later but I can see that there's been some arcing occurring on the power connector. It's kind of charred so that's going to need replacing. Okay here's our PCB on the desk ready for a clean up. Before we get stuck in let's just have a quick look around the board. I'll divide the board into sections to give a brief overview of how it works. First of all we have the power with the connector, the um, diodes and capacitors down there and a whole bunch of voltage regulators. Our main RAM is down the bottom there, that's 8 pairs, making 8 kilobytes. Here are our 7 ROM chips containing BASIC and the editor, our MOS 6502 CPU and the family of chips that go with it are dotted around the board as you can see. And at the top there we have our video ROM containing the character set and 2 video RAM chips, they're also 2114 chips. All those other chips around the top half of the board go into generating the video signals and we'll be going into that in some detail when we start debugging. Here's a closer look at the RAM and ROM chips. As I mentioned the RAM chips are 2114. Each chip containing 1024 addressable locations, each one containing 4 bits of memory. So in pairs they make 1 kilobyte of memory in each pair and we have 8 pairs so we have 8 kilobytes on this board. How about those ROM chips? There are 8 in total, one of them being the video character set ROM which is at the top of the board and 7 down here in locations H1 through H7. By the way, I realised way too far into debugging this board that these actually reference locations on the board. It took me a long time to find a lot of the chips when I actually had the map in front of me. Anyway, each chip is addressed by these addresses and I believe the addresses starting E correspond to the editor uh, probably just a coincidence. And we're going to try and read the contents of those ROMs later on. How about the connectors? First of all we have our built-in cassette edge connector, a Molex power connector on the board, a big old keyboard connector, this video connector which goes up to the video PCB within the monitor, a big edge connector designated in the user manual as a memory expansion connector, the IEEE 488 which is for disk drives, another this time external dataset connector and a parallel user port which I assume would be used mainly for a printer. Okay let's try and do some cleaning. First I'm interested in these capacitors because they look horrible. Just using a cloth with some alcoholic spirit and it seems to be cleaning up really well so I'm going to continue doing this on all of these disk capacitors. I then went on to try and clean the PCB with a toothbrush and a cloth 
and it did come out okay. It's not spotless, but back to back with how it used to look, I think it's looking a hell of a lot better. I did struggle to clean around underneath the components, and I didn't want to be too vigorous around them because they're old, I'm sure they're a bit delicate, we've even got patch wires as you can see there. But generally I'm happy enough to start working on it. Let's just have another few close-ups. There's our CPU, and our RAM and ROM chips. I'm going to start the diagnostic work here. So let's get the RAM chips and the ROM chips out and see if we can read the contents of the ROMs and see if we can write to and read from the RAM chips. It's not easy to find a off the market chip reader which will read the 6540 so I ended up making my own with an Arduino. Also I just continued and made my own uh, RAM tester for the 2114 chips. Unfortunately at least half of the ROM chips weren't working and a couple of the RAM chips weren't working. Next up some power circuit checks. I started with simple continuity tests around the power circuit side of the PCB. I did find some temperamental connections, uh, some dry joints on this connector. Um, I, I will end up replacing the connector but for now I just reflowed those joints to see if I could get the thing to start up. You can see the burn marks where that arcing has been happening which isn't a great sign. With that done I did a quick retest of the continuity and everything seemed a bit better. So I decided to put some power into it. I checked the AC voltages coming out of the transformer, they were okay. So let's have a look at the DC voltages on the board. We're looking for 5 volts out of every one of these regulators and that's what we got. That's good. But what about our RAM and ROM? Well, I bought one of these PET ROM RAM boards from Tynemouth Software and this will serve to replace the entire RAM and ROM on the board. Now I can sense the collectors out there cringing but the customer just wants this up and running uh, not restoring fully so this is the cheapest option available I think. It's got uh, jumper switches on it which you can configure as described in this sticker so if you wanted to only replace the RAM you can choose to do that or if you wanted to only replace the ROM you can do that. The, uh, the board fits in the 6502 CPU socket and the CPU goes into the board, so the, the machine is still running off the original CPU. Now Sod's Law, the other ROM chip, which is the uh, character ROM at the top of the board there in dark blue, is not working, so I'm going to need an adapter for that because the RAM ROM board doesn't replace that. And it's impossible to fit an EEPROM directly into this socket, it won't work, you need an adapter. But once you have one, you can flash a normal EEPROM with a bin file containing whichever character set you want, so I've just taken this top one which would be suitable for this age of machine. I'm using the old XGECU TL8662 to flash the chip and here's the adapter I'm going to use. This slots directly into the 6540 slot and takes the EEPROM on top piggybacked. There we are, lovely. Here is the RAM ROM board in place and in the background there you can see the 6540 adapter containing the new character ROM. Ok let's try and turn it on for the first time and nothing's happening, only when I turn it off, there it is, I can see something. So at least the CRT is kind of working or at least it's got some voltages. Right where do we start? Well I found out the simplest place to start with this is to check the drive signals sent from the main logic PCB up to the monitor PCB. These can all be found on connector J7 and fortunately traces are available and schematics online which show us exactly what we should expect to see on each of these pins. As you can see here the waveforms are doodled onto the schematic directly. Let's check our video in signal, it should be a square wave of uh, amplitude about 5 volts. Uh, here's the trace I got, it is not a square wave of amplitude 5 volts, so definite problem there. How about the horizontal drive signal? The waveform is described here. Let's have a look at what we're seeing. Actually that looks okay. So the horizontal drive appears to be working. And finally the vertical drive signal looks completely wrong on my scope so I'm going to say that is also broken. Taking a closer look we should have a square wave which is low for 200 nanoseconds and then high for 16.66 milliseconds. Our trace looks nothing like that so we're going to need to go probing around. My strategy here is just to follow the schematic for vertical drive back through the logic and probe around and look for anything that doesn't appear to be right. The first gate we encounter is in chip D8 and it's a NAND gate, so let's start probing there. 
Here's what we expect to see, basically a high output for every possible combination of inputs except the one where both inputs are high. Inputs are highlighted blue here, here is a trace of our output, and here are the traces of our two inputs. The inputs are both outputs of flip-flops further down the line, and they appear to be mirrors of each other, although you can't be sure of that by looking with a simple scope like I am here. Um, so basically, at least to my knowledge, I don't know if this NAND gate is functioning correctly or not, so I'm just going to keep going further down the line and see what comes next. I probed around these flip-flops and checked the clock signal that they share. It doesn't look great, I expect a clock to be oscillating consistently, although I don't know the design of this board so maybe that's right, not sure. Either way, let's keep looking down the line at where that clock signal comes from. The clock is the output of another flip-flop further down the line, so I'm going to check the clock to that flip-flop and here it is, it looks a lot better to me, so I'm fairly confident that clock is healthy. What about our JK inputs? Remember these are JK flip-flops. And also remember that we're a little bit suspicious of this chip because the clock signal it's generating doesn't look right. Okay, J on the top is oscillating steadily and K is held high. Here's our truth table and here's our output Q. Now let's be methodical and take a look at the two cases we've got here. Highlighted green, we've got J low and K high, which means Q should be held low which appears to correlate with the highlighted part on the output trace there. Now, when uh, J is high and K is high, Q should toggle with the clock, and that's exactly what it appears to be doing. So, I think this flip-flop's fine. Now, this went on for a while, just probing around, following the trace down the line, looking for problems. Generally, I found that the chips are okay, or I didn't have enough information really to tell. Until I came across one particular NAND gate, on the schematic here, highlighted D8. Interestingly, they drew it as an inverted input OR gate, which has the same truth table. Anyway, the measurements, the two inputs were high and the output was high, which is invalid. Now, this is the same D8 chip which we assessed right at the beginning of uh, this analysis, and we weren't sure if it was working or not, turns out it's not. So, here's some replacements, let's get one of them in. This is the chip in question. We did a pretty neat job of removing the old chip, so let's get the new one in. Alright, here's another look at our vertical drive signal now that we've replaced the chip. And as you can see, if you pause the video, you can count the, uh, the grid lines. We are actually high for about 16 milliseconds and low for a very short amount of time. There is some noise up there while it's high, which I'm not sure if that will cause us an issue or not. Here's our video in signal, looking a hell of a lot better. If you remember, that was just uh, stuck at one value when we measured it before replacing the chip. I still wasn't getting an image on the screen, so I've decided to build a board which will convert the video drive signals into a composite video signal. They are available pre-made, as you can see there in the top left, but it's more fun to build your own and the schematics are available. I didn't have a um, connector jack so I borrowed a modulator box from a Spectrum which is slightly heretical. Anyway it worked, look at this, here's our signal, we obviously have a cursor there, we just don't have any characters being generated or at least all our characters appear to be um, total, totally populated white squares. I properly went to town on the video circuit trying to debug this and the problem turned out to be with this adapter. It pulls up A11 to A15, so I had to actually write the character ROM binary file to the last 2K of the EEPROM's memory rather than the first 2K. That's why it was outputting all ones or FF, because I hadn't actually written anything to those last 2K of memory locations. And there it is working. So why wasn't our CRT working? Well, I was poking around trying to get it going, and it actually started coming to life when I was fiddling with the brightness adjuster. So there must be a bad connection there or nearby. And lo and behold, dry joints on the video board. They were quick and easy to patch up though. And here we go, let's see if it works. It does. Amazing. I couldn't help myself, let's try and write a program. Um, the keyboard was really hard to use, I had to press the keys really hard, so I'm going to have to take that apart and have a look. 
but it worked, check it out. I really want it to be able to load software from tape using this original piano deck, so I've taken it out so we can have a closer look at it. It doesn't have a button to open the lid, you just have to pull it open by hand. Now, let's go inside it because I'm certain that the drive belt is going to be totally useless. Here it is, and yeah, it's basically like meringue, it's just falling apart in my hands. Fortunately these are easy to source when you know where to look, namely eBay. Here we go, thank you Data Server Retro. A little bit fiddly putting this on for me, I'm not much of a um, analog drives and belts guy, but it seemed to go on and it seemed to turn around as I as I sort of twizzled this bit round. Although it wouldn't play tapes, it started chewing tapes, which is really bad, and I identified this mechanism to be the problem this belt or tyre and this roller just didn't have the friction to turn the um, right hand wheel although all I had to do really was clean the whole thing up with toothbrush and alcohol and a cloth and everything seemed to work out fine. With that done I really needed to change this connector because as you can see it burned. I sourced the correct replacement, luckily quite easy to get, it's just a, a standard Molex connector. There we are, that's looking a lot better, although the connection wasn't perfect still so as you'll see later I replaced the header as well. Now I took the monitor off to give it a clean, there's lots and lots of grime under here as you can see on the case that needed a wipe down. And this also enabled me to get to these mounting screws for the CRT PCB, which the, the screws had kind of come out and the whole thing wasn't really holding the board in place. There we are, that's looking a lot better now. I found some nuts that fit on the bolts and the thing is on there nice and firm. And it's also time to evict this spider. While the machine's in bits, let's get the keyboard out and take a look. It's very cute, isn't it? Um, so the keys seem to have a good action but they weren't making a good contact um, on the PCB below. Let's get the back off, take off these tiny little screws and see what we've got. Aha, the back is the PCB and there's a whole bunch of contacts on there, one for each key. It's lovely and shiny because it's been all buttoned up, so I don't think that any dirt or grime is the issue here. I am going to take a close up though because I really like this thing, it's just lovely and deep green and shiny. The problem is with these plungers, if that's what you can call them. They are rubber but impregnated with some kind of conductor and they tend to sort of polish up after lots of use over time. So what we're going to do is sand them down to hopefully expose some of that nice conductive material and restore easy function of the keyboard. I'm using 1500 grit sandpaper. I'm just going to tear a little corner off and go at every single one of these plungers for a while, see how it goes. Here I've done the right hand too. You can see that they're a lot darker, they're obviously rougher and it seems to be making a real difference to them so I'm hoping this is going to work. I've put it back together now, let's give it a little try. I can tell you it was miles better, although um, some of them weren't perfect, it was all in all totally usable and a massive improvement. Last couple of jobs now, I said I wanted to replace this header so I did, check that out, that is lovely and shiny. And that just left one job, which is to have a play on these games and, and applications that the owner managed to dig out of the loft. So we decided to do that together on the day he came to collect it. Here we are having a go on depth charge. Yeah, good damage. <laughs> no. Now, where do you begin then? I think four would be a good first shot. Oh, oh. On key, yeah. Yeah, you got him. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a miss. Gotcha. Oh. Good heavens. <laughs> what a difference to today's game. Yeah, I never correct. dreamt at the time that all this sophistication.